it's January 1st, 1600, and it is a brand new year in Scotland. You see, much of the rest of the world celebrated the new year on March the 25th, or some other day. And this is because about 20 years earlier, the Julian calendar had been ditched for the Gregorian one. And Scotland, after places like France and Germany and some others, had rejigged New Year's Day because we're all switching calendars and trying to sync up with each other. England, of course, would need to think about this for a bit until the 1700s, because if you know anything about English history, we, uh, we like being a bit different to everybody else. But well, this video series is not about history in general, but about beer, so we need to start talking about some beverages. Now, this century did not have as much happen in the world of beer as in others, but the groundwork was laid for some things in the world of beer that we now take for granted. And the first of these small things happened when in 1602, Anglican Dean of St Paul's Cathedral in London, Alexander Noel, did one of those amazing discoveries that we often do, the accidental type. His particular discovery was that beer, when you put it in bottles with corks, lasted much longer than when you put it into any other type of vessel. So, if you're enjoying a bottle of beer right now, you can know who started that trend. And it's yet another example of faith and beer colliding. Now, a few years later, a certain Guido Fawkes would go down in infamy, his image used on internet forums, centuries later. In Europe, beer was slowly continuing the trends that had begun in the 1500s. Domestic brewing was still going on, but large artisanal brewers and guilds were taking on a big chunk of brewing. Lager and spirits were becoming increasingly popular, and English brewers were now creating beers as well as ales, as Queen Elizabeth held a different view on beer to that of her father. Over in the Netherlands in 1615, the Grolsch Brewery was founded, and a year later, some Dutch folk would steal some coffee plants from Mocha and ship them off to Java. And they'd also started importing this green leaf thing from the Far East called tea. The widespread use of hops in brewing now meant that beer could be transported further, as it now kept for longer, which comes in handy, especially when you're setting off on a journey. And some Brits set off on a journey that some of my American viewers are all too aware of. That's right, it's time to talk about the colonies, and I expect the one thing that isn't portrayed as much in history lessons is the fact that the good folks of the Mayflower and other such ships would have been from the British Isles. Now, as we've seen in this series, the Brits do love a good brew, so it's time to point out the obvious. We were bringing beer with us. Hot on the heels of the colony ships were trade and supply ships, which of course held panels of boozy goodness in the hold. But because we love our beer so much, it wasn't too long before the first brewery in the Americas was founded, in what is now Manhattan, with other colonies advertising for brewers to come to the new world and make beer that hadn't been sat on a ship for ages. Indeed, the whole reason that the Mayflower landed at Plymouth was because beer supplies were getting too low for comfort, and the sailors booted the colonists off the ship because they wanted to make sure that there was enough beer to go around for the journey home. A mere decade after they had landed, these colonists had founded a tavern and a brewery, the first in Massachusetts. Back across the pond, Ireland had started to license booze producers, and at this point, Bushmills Distillery was one of the first official distilleries there. But in England, things were getting a bit tense as we come down for the nasty spot of civil war, and to help raise funds, taxes were slapped onto beer. No tax was put onto cider, however, and this meant that its popularity began to rise, and rather than being just a thing that was popular in southern England, it started to become popular all over the country, as the rise in beer prices effectively was pricing out the poorer members of society. Over in Venice, the first ever coffee house opened its doors, and in 1651, we got one in the UK, which was still arguing with itself about whether we wanted a king or not. In 1657, other firsts followed. Chocolate had its first shop open in England, tea was introduced to us, and the French discovered coffee. Also around this time, sailors realised that the rum that they'd obtained in their jaunts across the seas to the Caribbean kept much better than the beer they were carrying, and it was from around the 1650s that they started to drink rum instead of beer, as it tasted the same for much longer. It was also about twice as strong as the rum that you can buy today, and the question of what to do with the drunken sailor would not be answered for a little while yet. The next few decades would see some developments in science, thanks to folks like Isaac Newton, but the two that are pertinent to beer were the discovery of the cell by Robert Hooke in 1665, and in 1676, a Dutchman called Antony van Leeuwenhoek discovered microorganisms, something that would become important in beer production much later on down the line. A year later, the French started enjoying ice cream. We English folks started to enjoy tea, 
but it was mostly a luxury good at this point as import tax made it quite costly, even after we'd struck a deal with China to form a trading post there. As a result, many of the folks that were enjoying tea in the UK were actually buying illegal smuggled tea. And in 1688, William of Orange entered England, replacing the current guy in charge, James II. Some of William's reforms included increasing the duty on certain spirits. He wasn't a fan of French brandy, especially since England was now at war with France. Again. So he tried to tax it out of everybody's price range. Spirits had been increasing in popularity in this century, but because of the war with the French, William decided to encourage homegrown gin by reducing taxes and such on its production. As a result, drinking gin was actually a cheaper option than drinking beer, and its popularity skyrocketed as it now was in everybody's price range. But William's greatest influence on English beer was his government's declaration in 1698, where it was decreed that beer could only be sold in measures of pints, half pints, or thirds, and thus begun the love of the great British pint. This measure of one-eighth of a gallon has become more than just a method of measuring out beer, and it's fair to say that it's embedded in our culture as much as an institution as the royal family, having a cup of tea, or invading other people and stealing all their stuff. And it started here, at the end of a turbulent century for the UK, where we probably all needed a pint. This brings us to the end of the 1600s, where the English were guzzling a drink that was about three times as powerful as beer. And surely nothing can go wrong when that much booze is available, right? Right? But that's a story for the 1700s and for next time. So until then, go grab yourself a drink, keep asking questions, and I'll see you in the 18th century to see how this all plays out.